in the early 1720s when John Law, in an attempt to make the commercial endeavor of Louisiana more viable, promoted uh, immigration from uh, Germany and Switzerland. Thousands of people left Europe in the hopes of coming to find a better life in basically the Mississippi Valley. Of the thousands that departed, only a very small number actually successfully made it here. They were very successful farmers in the German coast area. They were credited with saving the colony from basic starvation. They were the breadbasket of the city of New Orleans. When the first German settlers were coming into this area, they were actually coming to a French colony. There were no German colonies. Their names were changed. French census takers would misspell the names, mispronounce the names. So what were originally standard German names, like Schaefer, became these kind of Frenchified names like Chevre or Chefre. For about a century, German immigration was fairly low until the 18-teens. The Napoleonic Wars at the end of the 18th century and into the 19th century slowly increased German immigration to America. Then in 1820, the United States Congress passed a law that all ports of entry to the United States needed to begin keeping records of people coming from Europe. By the time, 120 years later, of the main wave of German immigrants, they were Americanized, they were Creolized, many of them by this time spoke French, and the vestiges of their German culture were just that. Before the railroads, were even built across the Appalachians. If you wanted to get into the interior of the country, New Orleans was the best place to come. The numbers start to dramatically increase in the 1830s, where we go from hundreds per year to thousands per year to multiple thousands per year, then to tens of thousands. New Orleans was, in the 1840s, a major port of entry for Germans into the United States. Many of these people came over with business skills to begin with. It's one of the reasons they went into so many businesses in New Orleans. The German community has always been fortunate that there have been individuals who have very aggressively fought to maintain the German community's identity. In 1842, a person of German birth named Joseph Cohen started his own German newspaper, Deutsche Courier. He used this paper to promote a sense of German community. They were arriving at the port. They were trying to find a way to exist once they arrived here. They needed everything from food to clothing. They needed work. They needed to find relatives that were already in the United States. Where the Germans differed from some of the other immigrant groups is that the Germans had benevolent societies established here to help the Germans settle into the community, to help the Germans if they wanted to go beyond New Orleans, and many did. We have to remember that the majority of these arrivals set foot in New Orleans, and so they're recorded as arriving to New Orleans, but did not necessarily settle here. The railroads were very conscious of the fact that Germans were basically well-educated, were very conscientious. Southern Pacific Railroad, as it developed the Sunset Route from New Orleans out to Los Angeles, they were very conscious of attracting German immigrants to settle in towns along their route. Through continued urgings of Cohen in this newspaper, the German Courier, the Deutsche Gesellschaft formed, the German Society. And this was a society whose purpose was to help newly arrived German immigrants who came to the port of New Orleans to either settle in New Orleans or find passage to wherever it is that they wish to go. The Deutsche Gesellschaft, the German society, is probably the most important organization of the 19th century German community in New Orleans. They operated a wonderful lending library. They had you know, all the German newspapers available for them to read. They had books, for example, the complete works of Shakespeare in German. From 1825 to 1961, German New Orleanians founded nine Catholic churches, 33 different Protestant churches, and four German Jewish synagogues. So when we look at Holy Trinity here with its Bavarian style steeples built in 1853, coincidentally that was the year of the peak uh, German arrival to New Orleans, about 35,000. Around 1860, 1870, Germans were actually the largest ethnic group in the city in terms of people who were born elsewhere. In other words, there were almost twice as many German-born people in New Orleans as there were French-born. 
In the years leading up to the Civil War, there were large numbers of Germans in New Orleans, and they were settled in different areas of the cities. Late antebellum immigrants tended to settle in the periphery of the city, living shoulder to shoulder with Creoles, with Irish, Mediterranean and Caribbean ancestry, a very rich ethnic mosaic. There was significant German population in the third district, which is today's Bywater, Marigny, New Marigny area. Little Saxony, that area was called. There were Germans in the Irish Channel. Ecclesiastical Square is an excellent example. There were three churches there. St. Mary's Assumption was the big German language church, and then it was a smaller church, Notre Dame de Bon Secours, which was a French language church. But here's the Irish Channel where you have the three languages of New Orleans represented, English, German, and French. There weren't necessarily neighborhoods named after Germans, but there was a strong German presence throughout. Probably the most significant was in the former Jefferson Parish community of Lafayette. What is now the Garden District was then called the City of Lafayette. It was not part of the City of New Orleans. It was a separate incorporation. And then also we see Germans settling in Carrollton, which was also a separate community. There was also a significant German population on the West Bank in Gretna, uh, as well as in Algiers. So what explains this sort of dispersed geography of Germans and Irish uh, settling in the fringes rather than in the inner city? Well, that's where the cheap real estate was. You had employment in cotton presses, in rope walks, in slaughterhouses, along the flatboat wharves in Lafayette. The inner city, on the other hand, tended to be where the wealthy lived. Each little German area had its own newspaper, or multiple newspapers, because some of these Germans were liberal and some were conservative. So you had all these different points of view being expressed within each little German population. Through the 1850s, there were over a dozen German language newspapers. There were also musical clubs in each of these little kind of centers of activity. The Germans had a very important impact on music in New Orleans because many of their benevolent and fraternal organizations had associations with music. Menokere are male choral societies or uh, Gesangsvereine, just singing societies. It was a phenomenon that started developing in Germany in the early 19th century. All of these men from various walks of life would get together for singing and usually a lot of beer drinking. They would do choral pieces. Some of them had theater sections and they would do little operettas and little German plays. The earliest German choral society here was founded in 1851. It was part of the Turnvereine. The Turner Society is interesting because it was founded in 1851 on Orleans Avenue and also in 1851 on Orleans Avenue for the very first time lager beer was drunk in New Orleans. Before 1851 the only beer that was drunk in New Orleans was something that was called city beer and city beer was extremely bitter, apparently. In 1855, George Mertz brewed lager beer in New Orleans for the first time. In the early part of the 19th century, German opera was just sort of getting started. So when the German clubs that had a dramatic section did little operas, they did them essentially at the German theater. Uh, at the corner of Magazine and what is now Howard Avenue was the first documented German theater in the United States. The Civil War certainly put a halt to European immigrants coming in to New Orleans for a few years and it really didn't start building up again until the 1880s and one of the reasons for that was the silting up of the mouth of the river. It moved a lot of the immigrant passengers to other cities. Once the Eads jetties were constructed at the mouth of the river, which opened up the river. Trade boomed, so did immigration again. We see one other post-war peak, and that is following the Franco-Prussian War in 1871-72. And then in subsequent years, the number of Germans arriving is really just very small numbers. The German community was very strong in the late 19th century. There were lots of music organizations. There were prominent businesses, department stores, music stores drugstores that were owned by Germans. There were also German clubs that existed in each district. Today I would call them like get out the vote organizations. People who were foreign born really needed to try hard to give themselves a voice for risk of losing their voice. And this was very important as 
the first governor of the free state of Louisiana after the Civil War was Michael Hahn, who was born in Germany. And when you start looking at the stores that began opening along Canal Street, you see names like Kirschman's, for instance, a longtime department store in New Orleans. It opened in the 1870s. For a while, it was one of the biggest department stores in New Orleans. Gus Mayer, which opened in 1900, you saw names like Schwartz. Schwartz, which became Maison Blanche in 1897 and is credited with being the first real department store, or as they said in their day, New York department store in New Orleans. You go over to Dryad Street, which is now Aretha Castle Haley Street. You had stores like Handelman's and Kaufman's. Other stores in town included Krieger's, Hausman's, a jewelry store, and two of the most important German-owned stores in New Orleans were Wehrlein's and Grunewald's. They were both music stores. Those were major music publishing establishments not only in New Orleans, but throughout the whole South. When Grunewald Hall burnt down in the early 1890s, the owner of the company who had always wanted to build a hotel, but one of the city's most luxurious hotels at the time. The Grunewald Hotel, you're talking about the Roosevelt Hotel, which later became the Fairmont, which is becoming the Roosevelt again. Even after the Civil War, when all of the theaters had suffered tremendously, there was the National Theater being built. It actually, for about a 10-year period, maintained a German opera company. New Orleans was a city that was very interested in opera, it loved opera, and the popular operas of Germany would be performed here just as readily as the popular operas of France or Italy. Hanno Dyler, who was a professor of Latin at Tulane at the end of the 19th century, did a tremendous amount to promote the German identity of New Orleans. He was the music director for the Liedertafel, which was one of the prestigious of the choral societies. He was very active in the North American Singers' Union, the Nordamerikanische Sängerverein, which was the umbrella organization for all of the German choral societies in the United States. In 1890, he succeeded in getting the organization to have their meeting here in New Orleans. Thousands of German men from all over the country were coming here, choral societies. They had to have a hall for them to sing in, so they constructed a special Zengerhalle that seated supposedly 5,000 people and then they had to have a place for all of the out-of-town singers to stay, so they built a special hotel for them, a Zenger Hotel. There's no question that World War I and the anti-German hysteria squelched outward signs of German ethnic identity. The German banks were beginning to close in New Orleans. This is the era in which we see many things German renamed. You have sauerkraut being called Liberty Cabbage. A lot of streets named for Germans were changed. While the Americans chose to change Berlin Street to General Pershing, you still see German organizations functioning in the German language through World War I. By the time you get to World War I, too, the Germans were becoming more and more part of the community. There is a memorial to the young men of the 3rd District of New Orleans who fought for their country in World War I. And two-thirds of the names on that list are German. By World War II, so much of that culture was already lost by World War I, there was very little left to lose. Many of these cultural institutions come to pieces, go underground, or are essentially culturally squelched. The Deutsches Haus is an amalgamation of many German organizations that existed already. In the 1980s, they began holding an annual parade during Oktoberfest celebration, specifically to draw attention to the German community. When they were renovating the Deutsches Haus after it was flooded by Katrina, their theater was on the second floor. And they began redoing the stage. And when they removed the stage, they found the entire 19th century German lending library very securely stored underneath the stage. And a Fulbright scholar that's come and worked with it says that there's nothing like it elsewhere in the world. This is why our material relating to the Deutsche Gesellschaft and the Turner Society and all these different German organizations, the music societies of the 19th century, all exist in one collection called the Deutsches Haus Collection because they all came from that organization. They were donated to us by the Deutsches Haus. 
I don't think the Deutsches House is a remnant of the past. The members are simply too active.